every James Bond film ranked. Hey, what's up guys, it's Josh here. Today I wanna to do a little review on all 24 Bond films. Um, this is before the release of No Time to Die, so I'm not including this one, and I'm not including the other ones like Never Say Never Again and the old Casino Royales. The things that I'm going to rate it on is how Bond-like it feels, just the general Bond feel. Now, a big thing with me is interesting, nice locations. I just have to have it for it to be a top-tier Bond film. I have to be really easy to watch and enjoyable. A lot of these, films are kind of campy, they're kind of long. I like it to be really easy to watch while having a good story. I just don't like when he gets captured for most of the film, or I don't like it when it's clearly not Bond dominating every moment. That's what I'm coming here for. I don't mind if you do some stuff to make the villain seem strong, but I want it to be clear that Bond dominates it. If it's ever a little wishy-washy, I don't like the film. Number 24 is Octopussy. Now, this is the very first film to where I had come across some really slow points in films, but Octopussy was the one where I was just like dragging through it, like waiting for it to be over. And it's not really the worst movie. I actually wish it was more around the whole Octopussy cult because I actually do like Octopussy as the actress. I actually think it's pretty nice chemistry between her and Roger Moore, but it's just a diluted mess. They try to use Q a little bit more in there, which I do like. It just really really wasn't for me. This is the first one that I just really was not feeling. Nothing really hits home. They have the clown scenes, which I just don't like. 100% not for me. Number 24 is Octopussy. Number 23, the second one that was really, really difficult to watch, and that was A View to a Kill. Now, I actually like a good amount of stuff in A View to a Kill. I like Christopher Walken. The Bond henchman girl, I took me a little while to get used to her because apparently she was like famous back in the day, but I had never really seen her. Because there was an earlier Bond movie where there was a guy dressed up like a girl, that's almost what I thought when I first saw her. I was like, kinda didn't know what to expect, but she actually plays a really unique Bond villain and I could see why they picked her. The only reason I'd put this number 23 is how old Roger Moore is. There's a couple times when he smiles and he just looks scary. Like he goes like, you know, hey, hey. And it's like, it doesn't look like a grandiose smile. It looks like, damn, you're scary. And then also this was the worst with the stunt doubles. I mean, you could just see right away every single thing was like obviously a stunt double. He looked actually a lot shorter than Roger Moore. There was even a point where he would like race somebody in horses and just beat them. It's just every time I just was not on board with Bond being Bond in this one, although I did like some other stuff. So number 23, A View to a Kill. Number 22 is Live and Let Die. Now this is probably the most unique Bond film on this list. Um, this is really off in its own direction. It kind of brings magic into it, but there's just a lot of stuff that didn't hit for me. I like really big, like fancy sets. This one takes place in Louisiana, so there's a lot of just kind of fields and cheaper style scenery. Uh, nothing really elegant or over the top. I really like that Braun Samdi character. He was actually in the GoldenEye games growing up and he was actually in the last level and you had to kill him like three times. I actually was really looking forward to this movie for that Braun Samdi character. And if they were to go further with it, I actually would have really liked it. They barely ever used the Braun Samdi at all. The main villain, I just felt like he needed a little bit more oomph. Like I did like his, his acting and everything, but he just didn't have enough to be a Vaughn villain. He was just a little too simple. And then they had the guy with the claw. He was okay. I just preferred something like Dr. No, and I already felt like it was kind of like a Dr. No style gimmick to where he has this kind of like death claw. I like Dr. No's hands a little bit better, but Overall, this was his first film. It wasn't as bad as it could have been for how crazy they went out there, and I actually did not mind it that much. Number 22, Live and Let Die. Number 21 is The Living Daylights. Now, I actually really didn't mind The Living Daylights. The only thing I could say is that I really liked the opening scene of this movie, and then I really liked the last action scene of this movie. Everything else really didn't fit. Um, I don't mind uh, Timothy Dalton's portrayal of Bond, but the lines are just set up for him to be flirty and he's just absolutely not flirty. And I just don't see this kind of personality that he has attracting as many women as he has. And I almost think if they told him to play Bond, closer to a more flirty. I don't even think he could do it. When I just look at his acting, he just seems like he has a slight bit of awkwardness that doesn't portray that really flirty, suave, Bond-like atmosphere. But 
I really did like him in the serious stuff. It was, was really refreshing, by far the most serious and most intense scenes um, as far as the action. I love him for the action, but the flirty stuff just doesn't hit. He also has a little bit of a funky smile, but definitely not the worst one. Number 21, Living Daylights. Number 20, For Your Eyes Only. Now, this one was pretty good in that it has the probably the best underwater scenes to this time. Um, this movie was just very, very bland. Like it seems like they picked some random country with again a little bit of fields, nothing really extravagant. This is supposed to be really grounded because it came right after Moonraker. It, this is just really simple, but I gotta say I really enjoyed the underwater scene. When you compare this underwater scene to something like Thunderball, this is by far, by far the best underwater scene, the best underwater shots that we've had up until this point with Bond. It just is a little bland. And also you could tell we're getting into the 80s, but they don't have that 80s music. It's just really, really simple. This movie was just really, really bland. I know that's kind of what they were going for after Moonraker, but I just am not looking for bland in another Bond film. All right, number 19, Die Another Day. Now, I actually think this had a lot of promise. I do enjoy maybe the first, you know, 20, 30 minutes of this movie. Um, I do like the idea of they're really trying to rethink a new story that they could give 007. It seemed like the two movies after Goldeneye were just coming out so quick. This one where they were trying to come out with a different story, come out with a little bit more complexity. I really did like the ice area that they end up going to. I really liked the big mirror in the sky that would mirror the sun down, kind of similar to a man with the golden gun. There's like a villain in the very beginning and at the end it's supposed to be the same guy but it's a completely different actor and it just doesn't hit. But there was a lot of little stuff that I liked. I liked the ideas. I liked when they, the diamonds get shot in his face. I'm like, that's totally Bondy. I do like Halle Berry. I think she looks great in this. I just don't think she has great chemistry with Brosnan. And then people actually say they like that Frost girl or the other Bond girl in here. To me, she just doesn't hit. She seems like somebody who's really soft in real life, who's acting tough. That's just me. It does not come across correctly. So number 19 is Die Another Day. And number 18 is From Russia With Love. Now, I know people put this uh, by the top. Objectively, this is one of the better Bond films. This is the first time you get Q. This is the second one. So this one is actually a lot more complex than Dr. No. Just there's something about this film that just feels slow and bland. Now, I actually watched the first three Sean Connery films around like 2005. So I had already seen this one and then I also played the game. It came out on like PlayStation 2 or something. And people said that because they played the game, they actually liked the movie. I don't know what it is about this story in particular. It just does not interest me at all. And then on rewatch, it just was really bland. And the thing that really nailed it in the coffin was how many times like Bond is outwitted. He gets outwitted at the gypsy scene, the guy's right behind him, decides not to kill him, and then the guy comes up again, gets to jump on him again, and he has to use some Q gadget to get out. It just was Bond getting dominated. All this stuff feels bland, although I like Connery in his earliest roles because he has great acting, but. Anyways, number 18 from Russia with love. Number 17 is Dr. No. Now I just prefer this movie a hair over from Russia with love just because of how easy it is to watch from Russia with love. It has more complexity to it, but I even think just the beach scenes in Dr. No are just refreshing. I don't remember seeing anything from, from Russia with love that I really just enjoyed. I can't picture one scene that I just really enjoyed. Dr. No, it has girls pretty good. The beach scene's pretty good. Obviously it's really old. This was the first one and he delivers that Bond, James Bond. For me, if I had to watch one, I would pick Dr. No. I found it a tad bit easier to watch. Although objectively, I see where people would say from Russia with love is better because it is more complex and they entered this is like the first time they had Q and it's just a great film. I totally understand. But for number 17, number 17, Dr. No. Number 16 is The Man with the Golden Gun. This is a film that could have been maybe top five or top 10. I think this probably has top five villain duos of any James Bonds. I really like the idea of this, this hitman, and he has this golden gun with golden bullets and he's just like an expert marksman, like all that kind of stuff. It just is a great idea. He does these um, hit jobs for a million dollars a hit. It's just, I love the whole idea. And then on top of that, the Nintendo 64 game of GoldenEye, you'd have the golden gun. It would be like a one-shot kill. So I was actually really looking forward to this game because of 
all the little nostalgia that they put in GoldenEye for the Golden Gun. So, but unfortunately this movie just kind of falls flat. Like I remember the whole middle of the movie, really nothing happens. It kind of like the end scene when he's with Bond, you know, it does get a little bit better, but they just really missed the mark and did not use the Golden Gun nearly as much. I mean, they barely even used that at all. They barely even used the villain at all, but I really do like Scaramanga and I really do like Nick Back. Probably some of my favorite combinations of villains. And then I also did like their hideout where they're out um, on the beach and they got the, the little sun magnifying thing and they're gonna make this gun out of the sun magnification, similar to Die Another Day, but obviously done first here. Just a really classic Bond, especially coming from Live and Let Die. This was much more Bondy in my opinion. Number 15 is You Only Live Twice. Now this is a very interesting film because it starts off like a really Japanese themed Bond and I really like the idea of him, like him pretending to kill himself so his villains or the enemies kind of think he's dead. It gives him a chance to be a spy again. 007's been getting so big and so popular and it kind of makes sense like what can you do? Like what's some new idea you could take it? And I really do like them pretending to kill himself and all that kind of stuff. But him turning into a ninja, that was just kind of weird. I feel like this was created when maybe Kung Fu movies were getting famous, but it's just weird. I still don't get why he has to do it. He needs to like dress up like a Japanese guy. He needs to take Kung Fu classes. And I don't really get why he needs to do it. Maybe to be on some island. It has nothing to do with the ending. What makes this movie so high up is basically the whole ending scene. The big ending set. Probably the biggest set we've had so far with Blofeld's kind of cave area. I love the whole idea of it being hidden in a volcano. I love the idea of Blofeld. This is where Dr. Evil came from. I actually had no idea this was a real character. Dr. Evil had it was exactly this character from this movie until I watched it. Just very classic. And then on top of that, he's also Dr. Loomis from Halloween. So it's just really like this character. And the whole ending sequence is just such classic Bond to me. Unfortunately, this is probably Sean Connery's worst performance here, but but it still is okay. Number 14 is Moonraker. Now I think Moonraker is just a right down the middle solid film. It comes after The Spy Who Loved Me. I do think Roger Moore was better in the 70s than he was in the 80s and this film has a very very similar template and feel to The Spy Who Loved Me compared to For Your Eyes Only which came out only two years later is way different feel than Moonraker and Spy Who Loved Me. I like that they brought back Jaws. People complain about the ending in space to be honest I think like this movie's two hours and they don't even go into space for the first hour and a half hour and 45 minutes so it almost feels like you they, I don't even know if they were gonna go to space because I've seen so many of people's reviews I know that they go into space but it almost feels like it's a grounded movie because they spent so much time on the ground it's just a solid middle of the pack there's a lot of problems with it but it also is okay I'm gonna have to give number 14 Moonraker number 13 is diamonds are forever now people say you know talk about Sean Sean Connery kind of losing the role at this time. I honestly think that Sean Connery was just a little bit out of shape for this role. I actually felt like he was probably the most interested in this role besides uh, when he was up to Goldfinger. When you compare Thunderball and You Only Live Twice to Diamonds Are Forever, he seems a lot more into it, but he seems about 10, 15 pounds overweight, so he seems a little bit slower and not as agile. But I think if he were to lose a little bit of weight, he could have played Bond forever. And I'm pretty sure that he was like only about 41 in this movie. Roger Moore started playing Bond at like 43, 44. Pierce Brosnan started playing Bond at 43, 44. So literally this was the end of his movies and he was younger than the first films of other Bond people. And when you also see him in Never Say Never Again, he seems more mentally there than Roger Moore does in A View to a Kill, in my opinion. He actually seems really solid. So one of the things I don't like about it is, again, I do not like bland sets. And this, um, this is, takes place in Las Vegas, so it, you get a lot of dirt scenes. And although you get the casino scenes and that's nice, I just like big extravagant set pieces and nice scenery, and I do not like the desert. So number 13 is Diamonds Are Forever. Number 12, probably the, one of the most controversial entries on this list. I was almost positive this movie was gonna be number one or number two, and upon rewatch, I really did not like it for the Bond films. This was the third film that I just really did not wanna watch, and that is 
Casino Royale. Now, I understand that this is, in certain aspects, this is a really good film, but for a Bond film, I just was not wanting to watch this movie at all. I remembered all the twists, I remember all the turns. There was a few points this movie that is kind of bland, but this is just not Bond to me at all. I just did not like it. I mean, they spend way, way more extra time on his girl and they make him so weak compared to other Bonds. And then on top of that, they just throw it all away. To me, I like when Bond is just dominant and gets everything the way he wants. I mean, literally the very last scene and maybe the very first scene, Bond dominates. The rest of the movie, he kind of seems like he's dominating, but he's always getting screwed. Yes, he, he wins the Casino Royale. Oh, but then he's tortured. Oh, but he can't even kill the guy who's torturing him. So it's like everything that happens in this movie, he just seems like he's getting screwed. And the very last scene, yes, he does feel pretty Bondy. They make Bond way too emotional in this movie. I will say this is probably the best paced of all the Daniel Craig movies. The story kind of has the best flow, but it just is not what I'm trying to watch for Bond. I really did not want to watch this movie. I didn't even want to turn it on. And I'm surprised that I just really wasn't into it. I think this is better as like a first time viewing. But besides that, I don't know anybody who watches Casino Royale just to watch it. I really did not like it. I have enough respect for it not to put it any lower than this. I'm not putting it like top 24 or whatever, or 24 or 23. But wow, I would probably watch everything but Octopussy and A View to a Kill before I would watch this one again. I just not. Not for me, not for me at all. So number 11 is The World Is Not Enough. Now I was actually gonna put The World Is Not Enough above this, but I would rather watch The World Is Not Enough versus Casino Royale. Now I know The World Is Not Enough kind of fails on a lot of aspects, I totally get that. There's just so many things I wish they had done with this movie. This movie doesn't have that very good sets. The snow scenes was okay, but it kind of doesn't make sense. When I was a kid, Renard, the guy who doesn't feel pain, I actually kind of liked that idea. In this movie, he just doesn't hit. I don't think there was any point where I was like, oh, Bond is fighting this guy who doesn't feel pain, so how is he gonna beat him? I never really felt that. I mean, Christmas Jones, probably the worst, the worst Bond girl out there. And the only reason that she's the worst is because she's assertive and bad. You know, the other girls, maybe there was a Bond girl who was kind of bland, she was kind of quiet. Like, oh, I'm gonna say this bad line and I'm gonna say it loud. And it's like, I feel like Brosnan works well with so many actresses, but just not Denise Richards, you know? This movie failed on so many aspects, but because of that opening scene, because I like Pierce Brosnan, and Pierce Brosnan's probably my favorite Bond, Sean Connery's probably my second, so this one was just decent enough to watch, and I would watch it more than Casino Royale, 100%. All right, number 10 is Skyfall. Now, this was a movie that, when I first watched it, I really liked it, but I was really turned off by the main villain referring to M as mom and mommy, and I just, it just really killed me upon the first watch so I was interested to see about this second watch how much I like it and this movie it just it's okay it has a lot going for it the way that they build up the enemy in this movie he could have been one of the best villains but I mean literally almost no scenes between him and James happen I mean there's like an initial scene where they meet and they're doing this target practice scene I really like that and then there's another point and where they they meet up they battle a couple of shots through the smoke that's it. I mean, this movie is mainly about M, and I really like M, but I feel like they just, it was too much about M. And then on top of that, I like big, bold set pieces. The ending of this movie, they go to James Bond's old house out in the boonies, and they use all these, like, makeshift, like, things and traps. That's not Bond. Like, to me, Bond is just really high-classy, elegant, blowing your mind with new technology that you're seeing not with this movie. It just didn't hit. It had so much it could have connected on, but focusing too much on M and then not enough of James Bond and the villain, like give me a good 20 minutes of fighting and chasing with the villain. That's what I want to see, you know what I mean? But just wasn't in this movie. Although it has a lot of production value and a lot of things right and they introduced Money Penny and I think they also introduced Q. I actually like that. Just did not hit for me. All right, guys, number nine. I know, I know you guys are gonna hate me, but I'm gonna have to put Quantum of Solace. Now, the only reason I put Quantum of Solace right here is because of how easy this movie is to watch. Like this movie is the shortest Bond movie. It's about an hour and 45 minutes. I think most of these Bond movies are too long, especially Roger Moore and Daniel Craig. They could all be cut off like, Daniel Craig's you could probably cut off 15, 20 minutes. Roger Moore is probably about a solid 10 minutes, but I like the films. They just have too much fat to them. 
Quantum Masala is super short, right to the point. If you're, you're not gonna be dragging too much, this is probably the most brutal you ever see Bond. This is like the coldest you see Bond out of any of them. Um, he actually looks pretty young and pretty good in this one. They have um, some jump cuts and stuff, and I did notice that a little bit in the beginning, but later on it didn't bother me. And I was noticing that they would let some scenes, they would leave a little bit before they would cut. So it wasn't like there was jump cuts every time. I just really liked how brutal and intense this one is like this is bond like cranked up to 10 emotionless and like at the very end of this movie he kind of becomes more balanced he kind of loses that aggression and like in that killer instinct that he has the whole movie but i just really like this one for how easy it was to watch yes there's a few flaws the ending set of this movie i wasn't really impressed by the whole desert place that he's got but i think it's way better than skyfall i think the whole desert scene at the end is way more impressive than skyfall so this one was just super super easy to watch super aggressive the most aggressive james bond action movie that there is super easy to watch and then number eight was Spectre. Now Spectre uh, has a lot of problems to it. I think that they try to tie in too much. I kind of like Spectre back in the day because it wasn't really overly explained. You didn't really know where Blofeld came from. You didn't know how many numbers he has because he has henchmen with these different numbers. This one they try to make it very very clear like everything that's happened is just it's a very it lines up way too easy. Then on top of that they try to make Blofeld James's brother. I think that's what they try to do in Austin Powers right. Think about this in classic Bond terms. He's got his Bond gadgets. This is the first movie he's got Bond gadgets. This is the first movie where he doesn't have this big grudge or vendetta. The first two movies he's getting screwed over. In Skyfall he's hurt half the time. So this time he's on his A game. I love that opening scene. I love the, the cars. I love when he has the exploding watch. I'm like this is Bond. This is what I want to see Bond you know. And then on top of that there was a few scenes where he just kicks ass and that's exactly what I want to see like the villain would be one step ahead sometimes but he would do something to where it's like yeah that's right you're dealing with bond like he's just gonna he's just gonna mess some people up when you didn't expect him to so really like this one it's definitely the most bondy feeling of all the all the daniel craigs yes it has a lot of problems but i like bond feeling movies and this is the most bond feeling daniel craig movie there is it's number seven this was the most enjoyable sean connery movie that i watched and that was thunderball now i know a lot of people don't like Thunderball for a lot of reasons. This is when Sean Connery seems to be slightly over it, but he's not oh, he's not as bad as he was in You Only Live Twice. This is just a Sean Connery summertime James Bond. Like this is the most summery James Bond that's probably almost ever been created. It, I just love the summer themes of this one. There's so many good shots. This is the longest James Bond up until this point. And it just seemed like they had a lot of good stuff going for it. He doesn't really get captured most of the time. Like I can't stand when they when James Bond gets captured. He's almost captured not at all in this movie. Um, the girls are okay, the girls that he gets with. I liked the, you know, the idea of the boat, things like that. I liked the idea of the guy with the eye patch because he was also the guy from Austin Powers. I like that they brought back um, the Blofeld character in this movie because in From Russia With Love, you see him talking with the cat and then you go to Goldfinger, and Goldfinger, they don't show Blofeld whatsoever at all. Then you go back to Thunderball, and he's still a mystery. They're still building who it is. So I like that they keep the same theme. I really enjoyed this movie. Now, people also complain about the sped up scenes. Now, there is a lot of sped up scenes, and I understand they are a little hard to watch. However, the first 10, 15 James Bonds, they all had sped up scenes. Like, all very, very, very clearly sped up scenes. This one was the worst, I understand but I did notice it. And then people also say about the underwater scenes were too long. They're referring to probably the last fight at the end that's like 15 to 20 minutes, but the whole movie is like two hours. So that's all it is. It's, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes at the end. There was a little bit of scuba diving earlier in the movie, but that part, I don't think people are complaining about that part. And then I also did like when he escaped underwater with the sharks. This is the first time they feature sharks in the James Bond movie, and it doesn't feel corny like it kind of does later on. I just really, really enjoyed Thunderball. If I had to watch another, another Sean Connery film, right now it would be Thunderball. 
Number six is Tomorrow Never Dies. Now, this was a movie that I really was not impressed with when I revisited Bond a little while ago. I actually really, really like this movie. Like, Tomorrow Never Dies, although it has a lot of issues that don't make it the best Bond, it's not really this big, complex story. It's kind of just a little fast. This is probably one of the easiest to watch James Bond movies that's out there. Like if I was going to pick one movie just to throw on, if I had some people over just to be easy to watch, it would be this movie. You know, he doesn't really get undermined too much. There's a lot of good action scenes, um, mainly that one when he drives the car remotely. That's really good. I remember when he's on the bike with Wei Lee, that was really good. Um, there, it did fall apart. It doesn't really have the best ending. I wish it kind of went to another set piece for the finale versus the ship that we had seen before. It's a little simple. It's a little bit rushed. I do think Brosnan was a little bit skinny in this role versus I think he might look a little bit better physically in Goldeneye and World is Not Enough. But this movie was just ridiculously easy to watch, although it has a lot of flaws and isn't as complex as it could be. Number five is On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Now, it's really tough to rank all these movies, guys. I really do enjoy them all, but this one is just a really well put together movie. They spend, I think, like an hour and 20 minutes around this ski resort. Like, Bond shows up to the ski resort infiltrates the ski resort he has to escape the ski resort and like literally he like escapes the ski resort falls asleep and the next scene he's at the ski resort again so it's like an hour and 20 minutes at the ski resort another thing i didn't like about it was that it was clearly not him on the mountain like they would show this skier and then they would have him at just like a green screen and i was like just just put him on the mountain i don't need to see him skiing but just show me a video of him on the mountain not in a green screen but this movie was very solid. I actually do not mind this actor as James Bond. I, the only thing that I do wish is that he had uh, some more movies just because James Bond has this kind of feel and this kind of vibe and it's nice to have lots and lots of views, lots of chances to see him do different stuff. And in this movie, it's hard to get on board with him as Bond just because he only does one. However, I, I thought he fit the role good. He wasn't too young, he wasn't too old, he wasn't out of shape. Um, I actually thought he was pretty solid as Bond in this movie. I think this movie is very solid. The ending, it goes to a unique area, it tries to do things it's never really done before. It's just a solid Bond film. Definitely not number one for me, but it is very, very solid. It's number four, and it's crazy to think that this film got so high, and it's like, I, I like it, but I guess I just have to put it as high as I am, and that is License to Kill. It's amazing that the other Timothy Dalton one was so low, and this one was so high, but I just remember this movie having very little flaws. You know, it almost has like a Scarface kind of feel. Um, the villain is pretty good. I just remember the whole time I was pretty much engaged with this movie. Um, it starts off with um, a really great opening scene of James with his friend and his friends getting married and everything's great. And the whole movie is basically that um, this guy ends up killing his friend and his wife and he's going for revenge. The one thing I do regret about this movie is that he barely makes it known at the very end why he's even chasing him down. It would have been nice if there was like a real dramatic point to be like, this is why I've hunted you down this whole time because of this, you know what I mean? But really solid, don't have a lot of bad things to say about it. It's only number four just because of how complete of a movie it was. I didn't feel like it had very many faults in my opinion. So number four is A License to Kill. Number three is Goldfinger. Now, I gotta say I probably enjoy Thunderball a little bit more than Goldfinger, but Goldfinger's just got so much classicness to it. It's by far better than Dr. No from Motion With Love. Um, he's really interested in the role. Sean Connery is very interested in the role. It's great. There's so many classic um, scenes in this movie from The Girl Planted Gold to Odd Job to Pussy Galore. I will say Pussy Galore. <laughs> She's a little simple, like there, she doesn't really have anything extra. That name is really interesting. I, I do like the name, but the main thing that holds this back from me liking it a lot more than I do is because James Bond kind of outdoes Goldfinger a little bit, then Goldfinger catches him and then he just kind of convinces him, hey, 
don't kill me, just like keep me around. So for like 40 or 50 minutes, he's captured and it's just kind of like, I can't stand that in Bond films. He's literally captured to almost the end. And it just kind of makes me suspend the disbelief a little bit. But for all the other classic stuff in this movie, I think it deserves a number three. All right, guys, number two. I'm so shocked this is number two, but this has got to be the closest thing that's ever been done to a classic Bond film. And that is The Spy Who Loved Me Now. Man, do I love this film. I actually feel like um, Sean Connery never had a perfect Bond film. I felt like a lot of films were really, really good, but they didn't have one complete great film. I think The Spy Who Loved Me is a complete great film. I loved this movie from the beginning to the end. It's got so many great Bond moments. It's got a great new story of you know him versus uh, Agent Triple X. Bond killed somebody that Triple X knows and somebody that Triple X really likes. So Triple X says like, I'm gonna kill you as soon as this is done. And so you have this kind of like back and forth to like the very, very end. You know, she says she's gonna kill him as soon as it's done. You know, what's gonna happen at the very end? Who knows? I love the submarine car in this one. I like the villain's lair. Like he's got the probably the coolest looking underwater lair or water type lair of any kind of Bond films. I love the opening scene, especially for somebody like I like snowboarding. The opening scene, he's in a cabin on top of the mountain, you know, getting chased off by people and he like does a flip, he like goes off the cliff, pulls his air chute, and I was just like, man, this is this is as perfect as you could get to a classic Bond, in my opinion. Number two is The Spy Who Loved Me. Number one, you should know by process of elimination, but it is Golden Eye. Now, to be honest, when I rewatched all of these films, Golden Eye was the very first film that I watched, so I have not been able to watch Golden Eye having seen all these other films. However, I just don't think anything's going to be GoldenEye. I just absolutely love it. Um, Pierce Brosnan is my favorite James Bond. This movie just does everything right. I love the set pieces, where it kind of ends up with the last part with the satellite. I love the Bond girls, both of them are perfect. I think Boris with the exploding pens, a perfect quirky villain. I think 006 is, a, is an amazing villain too. I love the introduction of M. I love the opening scene. I really liked the video game of this and I revisited this movie around 2009 and I wasn't really as impressed as I thought it was going to be. But rewatching it, man, I really enjoyed it. And this is the reason that I watched all these movies, because I watched all the Pierce Brosnans, and then I was like, well, let me watch all of them so I could say for sure GoldenEye is the best. And it is. It still is the best. And I think for some people, you know, they're going to have their own opinions, especially younger people like in the more newer ones. But this is also a great mix of classic and new. It doesn't feel too old, but it doesn't feel too new. And Pierce Brosnan just absolutely nails it. I think he's more intense than Sean Connery. I would say he's just about as flirty in a different way than Sean Connery. I don't know if I could put him one or the other. They're both perfect for Bond. I just love this movie. Everything pretty much does right. There's a few dull spots like the Muffy scene or when he's meeting up with the US people or a couple times they have like some funky 90s music, especially when they're driving the car, that is a little cringy. And then there's also a couple other times where they inserted these kind of 90s kind of tones in there, but it's very light. GoldenEye also has this other type of soundtrack that isn't really 90s sounding that I really like. So half the soundtrack I really do enjoy, half of it is a little bit older. Some of the CGI too, on on like the jets hitting the Soviet base looked a little fake, but gotta put Golden Eye at number one. It's a classic to me. It's so easy to watch, so enjoyable. But what is your favorite Bond films? Name your top five. I'll be very interested to see. I thought I was gonna have to put Casino Royale number two or one and just be just like everybody else, but I absolutely could not stand Casino Royale. And if you like Casino Royale number one, it's a solid movie. It's the best paced, but no Casino Royale. Did not like it. I am not looking forward to watching it again. But we're on the road to 50,000 subscribers and I couldn't do without any of you guys' help. You guys are the best. I'm having a great day out here. Hopefully I'm having a great day at home. See you all in the next video. Peace.